In the world of investing, the term Wall Street is often thrown around. While this is somewhat of an ambiguous term, essentially what's being referred to is a collective of institutions that analyze and try to predict what the market is going to do next. In today's video, what I'd like to attempt is to put together a number of reports from known institutions to try to get inside the mind frame on how Wall Street is viewing Rocket Lab. My name is Scott. Welcome to the channel. Let's talk Rocket Lab. So starting with revenue, you're going to notice that some of these numbers will have a drop off at a certain year. So for example, the revenue only going out to 2025 or 2026, we're going with what we have available here. So some of these reports, they're only going out to 26 with revenue. Some go all the way to 28. Um, some might have EBITDA, some only have net income. So you notice that some of these are representative in some of these slides and others not so much. This is, this is why. You'll also notice at the bottom that there are two entities. One is called Redacted and the other is called Retail. So the Redacted, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. I had a model that was sent to me and it's a little bit more elaborate than what is publicly available. So rather than put the name out there from uh, where it came from or who it came from, I figured it's probably in everybody's best interest if I'm not out here doxing people. So that explains what Redacted is. So take it with a grain of salt if you need to. We have plenty of other examples to go by. So past that we have retail. Now I wasn't sure what to name this, but retail is, well, us. So retail is reading from our own valuation model here. So these numbers are showing what we are expecting in-house. So the information that we're going through today can be found in a new section of the valuation model simply called comparison. Essentially what's happening here is the information is being fed from the valuation section and is being compared against the reports that have been manually entered for the sake of this video. So the update to the valuation model, including this comparison tab, this will be available once Rocket Lab reports their Q2 results. So that'll probably be sometime um, late July, early August timeframe. So if you are interested in viewing or downloading the valuation model for yourself, I'll be sure to have the link in the description below. All right, so let's hop back to revenue. So as mentioned previously, we have different varieties of what is available here. So some of these drop off 2025, some 2026, 2027, etc. You'll notice that we are among the more conservative of the group. So this is something that I've made abundantly clear in the past is I don't mind being a little bit bearish on the stock, if you will, and then having my expectations um, surpassed, right? I'd rather do that than the opposite way around where you're expecting this super high curve for revenue and it ends up falling flat for lack of a better term, but better to be bearish than um, too bullish in my opinion. Next up, gross profit. It's more or less the same. We got us being a little bit more on the conservative side and uh, Redacted is, again, most bullish, similar to what we just saw with revenue. Past that, we're looking at research and development and you'll notice right away that only three of us have reported that. Um, this is the one that's a little bit less, uh, less visible, we'll call it. Now, you'll notice that we take a big dip after 2025 uh, down in 2026. Maybe this needs to be corrected and revised upwards a little bit. Initially, I was taking the angle that once Neutron is, you know, more or less through its primary development stage, that we are going to see a decline in R&D. But maybe I have this wrong, and maybe the, the satellite manufacturing for the Constellation, or the, I should say the, the Constellation development, maybe that's going to have a bit more of a higher line, maybe something a little bit more in line with Redacted. You can see that Cantor Fitzgerald, on the other hand, they're expecting a pretty meaningful uptick, which I find a little odd, to be honest, because... I mean, if, if Neutron's way down here, I'm not sure maybe they're expecting like the development of an even larger rocket. I'm not too sure, but it seems like a, a unusual uptick for the development of the Constellation or whatever, whatever Rocket Lab has next. So for SG&A, it's a similar situation where there's the three of us reporting and Cantor Fitzgerald is expecting a pretty big hike between 2026 and 2027. Now you'll notice that Redacted on this one, they are a little bit more, I guess, optimistic in this case, whereas if you extrapolate Cantor's out, it'd probably be way above ours, the retail. But um, yeah, I don't know, maybe we need to bring ours down, maybe Cantor needs to bring theirs down, or maybe Redacted needs to bring theirs up. But I guess time will have to tell for that one. For operating income, I'm finally not in the most bearish camp. You'll notice that we are exceeding Cantor by a little bit, and that redacted is quite a bit higher. Now for those unfamiliar, the operating income, that's the gross profit minus the operating expenses. So that's 
Think of it like you have your revenue, you have your cost of revenue, and then under that you have the research and development and SG&A. So whatever you're left with after that point, that is what you're going to be calling your operating income. So none of the income tax provision or anything like that, none of that's been factored in yet, as we'll see with our, our next slide, net income. So for this one, this is a little bit odd because B of A Securities, you'll notice there from 2024 to 2025, everything's looking good. And then they have this big downturn. Now, similar to Cantor for R&D and SG&A, I'm assuming that this is the expectation that there's going to be some sort of uh, maybe extra development for the, for the constellation. I'm not too sure. They don't really explain too much more, but for whatever reason, they have it coming down in 2026. And so for the other three, we're more or less on par. Uh, I bet if you were to extrapolate Cantor's forward, you'll see that we're probably in the mid-range as far as being optimistic or pessimistic, bearish, bullish, whatever you want to call it, with Redacted being the most bullish of the group. Earnings per share, this more or less ties in with net income, but there is one slight discrepancy or variable, if you will, that we'll get into in a moment, but similar thing. More or less, we're all in agreement here. B of A takes that downturn. And if you bring things out forward, we're probably kind of more or less all in the same ballpark. Now for EBITDA, this one is a little less clear than some of the others. And the reason for that is because Deutsche Bank as well as Redacted, these are both using adjusted EBITDA. B of A securities, it doesn't say adjusted. So I'm pretty sure that they're only using regular EBITDA. And ourselves, retail, we are definitely using EBITDA. So the reason we're using the regular EBITDA rather than the adjusted EBITDA is because we're already making the adjustment to the net income. That's what EBITDA is. So to make another adjustment to what's already been adjusted and call it adjusted EBITDA, it just seems like there's more steps than need be, right? As investors, we're looking for, are you profitable or are you not profitable? The company can say, oh, we'd be profitable if we stopped developing the neutron and we shut this business down and we stopped doling out compensation and a million other things. but the fact of the matter is you're profitable or you're not profitable. So we're just kind of eliminating one step here and just using plain old EBITDA. So next up, as alluded to a moment ago, is this number of shares outstanding. This would directly impact the market cap in the long term is the big one, right? And this is one that I found a little bit odd is because you can see that Cantor and Redacted, these are both kind of assuming more or less flat growth. But you can see that up to this point, there's been very much not flat growth in terms of shares outstanding. Now, management might suddenly turn off the faucet that is stock-based compensation, but you know, probably not, right? Granted, that will become less and less as a percentage of revenue over time, but the point stands, there's still going to be uh, increasing shares. Eventually, one day, ideally, you know, we'll have plenty of cash and they can do buybacks and whatnot, but that's not going to be for many, many years, in my opinion. So this is why our number of shares outstanding looks so egregious in comparison to the other two. Now, speaking of stock-based compensation, you'll notice that Cantor is on the very much the high side as far as what to expect throughout 2027. So it seems like they're expecting a big inflection as of 2025. And, you know, I got to be honest, I don't love that as a shareholder. I'm hoping it's a little bit more in line with Redacted and definitely more in line with, with us, where it's actually going to go down as a percentage. But I mean, this is one of those things where it, it's very in, kind of probably intentionally unclear in the SEC documentation as far as what to expect in the future. So we're going to have to just, I guess, cross our fingers on that one that we don't get diluted into oblivion in the form of stock-based compensation. But for the time being, we're just going to have to leave it there. So for capital expenditures, you'll notice this graph kind of looks flipped upside down. The reason for that is because these numbers are actually descending, but it more or less tells a similar story as what we've been seeing before. So we don't have a lot to go by seeing as Cantor Fitzgerald is the only other entity that, that reported this. But what we can derive from this is that they are expecting the whatever comes next, probably the constellation, to be a little bit more expensive than what we are expecting. And maybe we need to revise this so the satellite build out it ultimately becomes more expensive. But that's something that's definitely worth considering as we start to understand Rocket Lab's constellation plans as time goes on. So finally, we have free cash flow. And unfortunately, there was only two of us that reported B of A Securities and us. So this one, you'll notice that we are actually quite a bit more bullish than, than B of A Securities. But like I mentioned, there's not really, there's not, there's no other players to kind of mark by. And I would imagine that like the redacted one, for example, 
I would imagine that that one is quite a bit higher than what we see here. So now that we've gone through all of the key performance indicators, what we're gonna look at next is the share price and more importantly, how each of these entities is arriving at the share price. So starting with B of A, they have a $10 price target. And the way that they arrive at this is based on a long-term DCF of base, bull, and bear cases for different revenue and cash generation scenarios between now and 2023. Their discounted cash flow factors in 14% discount rate and assigns a 33% probability to each of the three cases being the base, bull, and bear case. Next up, we have Cantor Fitzgerald with a $6 price target. And they arrive at this via a blended 2026 expectation for enterprise value divided by revenue and 2026 expectation enterprise value divided by EBITDA relative valuation with 50% weighted to each scenario. From there, they give a 1.5x premium that is applied to both multiples given the company's successful track record of launches. Deutsche Bank has a $10 price target. And to arrive at that, they use the valuation that compares Rocket Lab to SpaceX as a reference, using 10 to 15x enterprise value to sales. They mentioned that applying this range to their 2026 expectations for revenue would put Rocket Lab at a share price of $14 to $21. Now they do mention that this is a little bit on the higher side. So what they ultimately end up going with is an 8x enterprise to sales for launch and a 6x enterprise value to sales for space systems. Next up, we have KeyBank with a price target of $8. They comment that Rocket Lab is currently trading around four times price to sales on their blended 2024 to 2025 expectations versus its historical range of 15 to 20x. From there, they kind of land somewhere in the middle at 7.5x, arriving at their $8 price target. Finally, we have Redacted with an $8 price target. Their primary valuation methodology for Rocket Lab is a two-step discounted cash flow model. So using this DCF valuation, they arrive at a 12-month forward equity value of $8 per share, along with a base case range of $6 to $15. Past that, they mentioned that they leverage a terminal growth rate of roughly 3% into their discounted cash flow model. Now, one thing regarding these price targets that doesn't quite um, compute with me, and I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody's uh, methodology here. I'm just saying it's it's a point of interest for me. I'll pick on Cantor Fitzgerald. They are using a blended 2026 expectation enterprise value to revenue and 2026 expectation enterprise value to EBITDA. But that is such an odd metric to use because right now we're mid 2024. So I guess that's 18 months out to 30 months out, 2026 to arrive at a price target that's 12 months out. And to make it even stranger is the previous report that they put out, it was also using 2026 expectations. So I guess that would be like 21 months out to, well, you, you understand what I'm saying here. It, it just seems unusual and it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating to consider all of these different methodologies and how people are arriving at these price targets. And, and the one that Another, I guess I'll, I'll pick on a couple is Deutsche Bank and KeyBank. They're both kind of like, um, one is comparing it to SpaceX, which you can't really do. And granted, they do they do bring it down a fair bit. But it's still, it's like, well, SpaceX and Rocket Lab, they kind of look similar, but they're very not similar. SpaceX's valuation, that's Starlink, right? And Rocket Lab doesn't have a Starlink. And maybe they do down the road. I'm, I'm sure they will to some degree, but you can't quite compare the two. One is borderline an information company and Rocket Lab is still a rocket and spacecraft company. Now, that is going to change in the future, of course, but at what point, I'm not sure. And then for KeyBank, they're just saying, well, Rocket Lab used to trade within this range, so it's gonna maybe trade at this range again. And I think that's a big faux pas as well. Now, as far as how to actually value a company, that's what I'm fascinated by. You could use you know, price to sales, price to uh, earnings, enterprise to EBITDA, um, windage growth rate, price to earnings growth. There's so many different ways to skin a cat. Um, that's such a weird saying. So all this to say, there are a lot of different ways to value a company. And I wanna hear yours. So be sure to leave a comment below and also be sure to check out the Patreon to view and download the valuation model that I referenced in this video that includes price targets that go all the way out to 2030.
Thank you for the hangout. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Have an awesome day.